My name is, hi everyone. <laughs> oh, that was lovely. <laughs> My name is Tara Doherty. I'm the education assistant here at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And on behalf of the festival, I wanna take a moment and thank you so much for your time and joining us today for the Living Ideas Art and Community Dialogue Series panel discussion today. This uh, panel is gonna be, well, is live streamed right now. So hello to everyone on the World Wide Web. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> if you have any questions at all, pl please feel free to post them on our Facebook page. We will be monitoring it during this panel and asking the questions to the actors. The OSF Living Ideas Art and Community Dialogue Series is a new humanities-based program that explores the local impacts of global issues and seeks to forge connections between individuals and communities through collaborative programming centered on topics inspired by the works on the festival stages. Information about the Festival Noon and the Living Ideas Art and Community Dialogue Series can be found at www.osfashland.org slash living ideas. Or for those of you that are here, we have flyers in the front of the room that look like this. A few upcoming events. Tomorrow, Friday, September 4th, we'll have a lecture demonstration. Edmund Dante's in the sword. The Art of Stage Fighting in the Count of Monte Cristo, featuring you, Jonathan Tapo, and Al Espinoza. Saturday, we'll have our final lecture of this year's Festival Noon series, Eugene O'Neill's Journey, The Past is the Present is the Future Too, featuring Eileen Herman, who is an Eileen, who is an O'Neill scholar. Tickets for these events and more can be purchased at the box office. At 12.45 today, we'll have a little pause to allow for those of you who have tickets to the, today's matinee performances to travel to those shows. We ask that you pass quietly as to not interrupt the end of the lecture. Finally, please set your cell phones on silent and there is no photography during today's lecture or panel discussion, excuse me, except for our staff photographer, Jenny Graham, will be around taking pictures. Finally, I have the pleasure of introducing today's panels, panel speakers and members from the cast of Sweat. Carlo Alban, Kevin Kennerly, Kimberly Scott, Stephen Michael. Oh, Ke Kevin Kennerly actually will not be joining us. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Michael Spencer, Shermel Tillman, KT Vogt, and Tyrone Wilson. And monitoring today's panel is Julie Felice Stubiner, who's the uh, dramaturg for Sweat and is also the associate director director for American Revolutions, the United States History Cycle, who's been, who's been an immensely great partner in this process. So without further ado, let's welcome our panel. Thank you so much. I just thought I'd sit on Tyrone's lap. Oh, for a while. Not, um, not today. <laughs> not today. It's not that kind of show. Um, hi, uh, as Tara so lovely said, uh, I am Julie Felice Stubner, and I am the uh, associate director of the American Revolutions Program. And uh, it is just awesome to see so many people here. Last night I was here on uh, Friday, and I was here, last Friday, and I was here all all by myself with Rob. And so it's so nice to be surrounded by these beautiful people. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you guys could quick introduce yourself. Uh, and uh, just say how long you've been in the company. And uh, remember to talk into the mic, which I'm doing a terrible job of, I'm aware. <laughs> Hi, I, uh, I am Stephen Michael Spencer and uh, playing Jason in Sweat, and this is my first season here. Kimberly Scott, this is my sixth season. Jamel Tillman, I play Chris, and this is my first season. Uh, Tyra Wilson, I play Evan, this is my 21st season. <laughs> <laughs> Carlo Alban, I play Oscar. This is my first season. Yay! Yay! Hi, I'm KT Vote, um, and this is my, uh, I'm, I'm playing uh, Jesse, and this is my eighth season. This is my fifth season, which is uh, remarkable to me. I'm actually just 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 to overshare a little bit. Um, it's a, it's the anniversary of when I came up for my interview here, which is the first time that I had ever actually been to Oregon, much less OSF. Um, so it's it's I, I'm having a lot of nostalgia, which we know is a disease. Um, <laughs> That's right. 
Yeah. How many? How, it is. I, sometimes, sometimes it's very nice. How many of you have already seen the show? So we know. Okay. So a lot of you have have seen it. Who has not seen the show yet? Okay. So we will try to avoid spoilers as we can. Um, at at, uh, at various points, uh, or at some point, uh, I'm going to become uh, loose from this chair, and I'm going to start wandering in the audience. Um, uh, last week, Rob was Oprah. This week, I will be Phil Donahue. Um, <laughs> The microphone reminds me of Phil Donahue, right? It's like the same kind of microphone he had. Um, yeah, or Donnie and Marie was our other joke last week, but you know, we recycle. Um, and, uh, uh, and also, uh, so I'm gonna start the, the gang off with uh, some questions of mine, but uh, just raise your hand if you have a question that you wanna jump in with, and I will try to find you with the microphone so you can ask it, okay? Okay? Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, I was wondering if anybody up here, uh, so many of you have done both new work and classics, and I was wondering if you could, if anyone had any fun stories about the, the difference between working on the two. <laughs> um, the major difference is, is that when you're working on a classic play, there are very few um, pieces of scratch paper in the room. When you're working on a new play, <laughs> One of the Amer the American Revolutions plays that was produced, the very first one, uh, was American Night, and I worked on that. And uh, at the end of that process, we took a picture of a shopping cart full of revision pages, <laughs> the discard pages. So the major, I guess the major difference is it's a much neater room. <laughs> We've been joking, actually, in American Revolutions um, uh, about uh, we should we should buy a tree, like we should have like you know we d you dedicate a tree, that we should dedicate a tree to every one of the American Revolution shows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is my first experience doing uh, this this caliber of new work and fully producing it, and to have I mean the major difference for me was to ha be able to have uh, our playwright, our storyteller, in the room. You know, usually we're doing th we're doing plays, these classics, and we're like well, Shakespeare. What were you talking about? What do you mean? here and this time we could say hey Lynn Nottage what what do you mean and she's just there to answer which was a huge help and a very different experience for me and uh, both Tyrone and Kim had been in Lynn's plays before had any of, uh, other of you done Lynn's work before no and Lynn wasn't was Lynn here at all when you guys did Ruined or in, no. were you in Intimate Apparel also no no, no. Uh, I was in uh, 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 Ruined and Crumbs from the Table of Joy so I, as I told Lynn I want to be a Lynn Nottage uh, canon actor <laughs> <laughs> I second that yeah. that'll work um, uh, you know uh, Ruin was a finished piece pretty much when we worked on it, you know. Um, it was, uh, when we started rehearsals, it had just finished, or was it still running in New York? I don't think it was running in New York, no, but it was running somewhere. Right. I think it's, Seattle. Exactly. We were the first, I think, second production. We were the very first second production. Um, <laughs> it, it was, and Lynn was, huh? West Coast yeah, we were yes, the West Coast it was the West Coast premiere. premiere, and it was, it was, uh, she was gracious enough to come and see the show, which was really, you know, it's one of those things, the first production, the first production outside of the production that the playwright works on, you kind of want to know what the playwright thinks, because, and there and there and them coming means a lot because they also want to see you know how is this play living outside of me being in the room and um, you know she was very very gracious and and continues to be and I think that you know I'd like to think that you know her coming here and doing her newest play spoke to the quality of that production yeah I can attest that it totally did um, one of the things that's been really fun with American revolutions is um, once the playwrights are commissioned we try very hard to bring them out here to OSF to see how because we work in such a weird way um, and so we try to bring them out here so they can uh, see as many shows as possible see the spaces all the three different theaters and also get to see the acting company and so that trip when Lynn came to see Ruin she had only been commissioned here for American Revolutions for just a few months but that experience of seeing shows here and seeing you guys and all your work totally informed what she was going to do and also gave her an idea when she was finally coming to work on her play of what working here was actually going to be like. There was actually a really great moment when we were in rehearsal for uh, Sweat. Lynn was here for the whole time. She was here for all nine weeks of the rehearsal and preview process. 
And uh, during that time, Lisa Loomer, whose play Row is coming up next year, Lisa lives here in Ashland, so she was up on campus. And Kiara Hudes, who wrote uh, uh, Water by the Spoonful and Happiest Song Plays Last, had come out to see the, the second production of Happiest Song Plays Last. And uh, where is Jenny? Oh, Jenny's already gone. Uh, Jenny Graham took a beautiful picture, which is up on the OSF Facebook page of the three American Revolution's women just hanging out. Um, but that's part of the the ethos of the program. So it's it's always and it's always fun when it's an artist like Lynn who is really just open and fun. Um, all right, I talk. I talk a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> did you have anything? No, I did. Did I look like it? You did. You look like you. Look I always look like you that. Do. I always look like I have you're, something. You're to anticipating. Say. Yes, my acting. Yes. Oh, <laughs> acting. Um, okay. Yes. I was going to say, uh, just to go back to your first question about the difference between working on a new play and a classic. Another thing is that. You know, when you're working on a new play, especially with a playwright as collaborative as Lynn, um, y y y your DNA a little bit ends up in the play. You know, you have you have some agency over what this character becomes, um, and that's and you know, and once the first production, I mean, she may make changes along the way, but this being the first production, you very much have your your DNA is in there. You know, in one way or another. So. It, it's, it's an honor and then also a bit of a, a responsibility in some sense to really do your best to try to find the truest form of that character that you can because it's going to be, especially with a play like this, it's going to be done a lot, you know, so. I, I have a, an example that I, I kept miss saying a line that she had written. <laughs> And I just kept doing it, and she said, no, 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 that's, you, you, you've added a word there. I said, okay, I'm sorry. And I did it like five times, and finally she said, just leave it in there. <laughs> and I was like, really? No, I could really learn it, I can't, it's just one word. I could get it out. She said, no, 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 it actually sounds good. And so it goes right with that. It's like, I, I should get credit for that one word. <laughs> but I mean, it's that kind of process, and, and Carlos exactly right. There's nothing more wonderful than being in the room and you just saying something or doing something off the cup and hearing the playwright say, keep it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> keep it. And you know, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be, you know, um, retired looking at a play for sure that I've done, reading that and going, that's my line. <laughs> That's mine right there. I know there are some in this play for sure. You know, he has one that I love very much. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, I said that? Go to rehab? Go to rehab. Go to rehab. No, she wrote that. Okay. It was my delivery. I'm not I was the scene, delivered so it so well. He delivers it so well, I took for granted it was his line, and they said, keep it. <laughs> You guys are having too much fun. You should take this comedy show. Ah! <laughs> we'll be appearing at Chuckles next week in Grants Pass. Chuckles, Zanies. Zanies in Chicago. Oh my God, I used to do stand up there. Um, <laughs> did. Um, it's part of the reason why I'm so unfocused. Um, I, but to, to, to talk about that a little bit, it's one of the things that I find most exciting uh, working on a new play is how we all do contribute in the room. And one of the things I found really fascinating with this project, uh, and it happens a lot, with, especially with new work, that uh, directors and playwrights collaborate uh, fiercely and in a different way. And, um, and it was interesting to me in the room watching uh, just sort of the, you know, Lynn and Kate always, uh, Kate Wierski, our director, they always sat next to each other and they were kind of always heads together. And Kate is kind of a low talker. Um, and so she was constantly talking to Lynn and I could never tell what they were talking about. I, I found that very disconcerting, honestly. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, you know, it was interesting because there were times, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> but there, there are, it's funny because it's true. Uh, there are times uh, when I found it interesting of just sort of who, when Lynn would have a directing note and Kate would have a writing note. And I was wondering, um, in terms of working on new work, if that has happened to you guys a lot, those of you who have done a lot of new work. I'm going to leave the stage now. <laughs> I think um, I've had it happen, you know, more than once. And it just depends on, uh, it depends on the relationship, the maturity of the, of the, the artists, you know. Um, you know, 
case in point, uh, one of the first plays I did in my professional life was uh, the original production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. August Wilson was in the room and Lloyd Richards directing and Lloyd was his, you know, was the guy who brought August to light, you know. And um, um, August had a great team, was a poet, you know, really primarily more than a playwright. So it took Lloyd's sense of dramaturgy. You know, he was an amazing dramaturg. He was a great director, but he was an amazing dramaturg. So his sense of going to August and saying, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And sometimes actually having that moment where it's like, this isn't working, riff on that for a minute. And being able to have be actors in the room just you know, uh, what's the word? Um, improv. Im yeah, improv, improv, improvising on the moment on top of the words that are already there. And then August going away and saying, okay, here's the scene, you know? And sometimes in that, again, there comes that moment where you go, <gasps> you know, yeah, that was mine, that was mine, you know? But, but um, uh, definitely it depends on the maturity of and, and, and the, the roles that they choose to take, you know? Um, um, I'll let somebody out and talk about a whole bunch of, I'm a new play girl, so I can talk about a whole bunch of different. I think, I th I'm sorry. I, I think one of the biggest moments for me that that came into fruition was the last moment of the play. And Carlo and Steven, you can correct me and chime in if I'm wrong, but th that was a very tense and specific moment that both Kate and Lynn were looking for and the dialogue is very sparse there's not a lot but there's so much that's not said within it and I believe that Kate gave us the license to actually explore that and really kind of find out what that means and how we can move forward and you know incorporating uh, Jack Willis in that moment and what does that mean to the whole arc of the play I'm, I hope I'm not giving anything away for people who didn't see it, but to go on that moment in terms of collaboration, uh, yeah, I'm not giving it away because it's not going to happen when you see it. Um, but actually, uh, my character was in that last scene in the in the script that we read, and we read the script uh, around the table, and then the first time we staged it, um, I think as soon as the scene was finished. Uh, we had read through it, trying to stage it. I think we all kind of sensed that that was not the best decision for that scene. And so there was a little conference between uh, Kate and Lynn. And uh, I remember, I remember this so well. Lynn kind of, Kate kind of turned to me uh, across the room and, and she had that look like, I'm about to take you out this scene. <laughs> and I, and she said, we've been talking. And I said, I'm gonna take, I'm, I'm going to, I, I'll do it for, I'll take it for the team, Kate. I'll take it for the team. And, but it was, it was such the right idea to not have, Evan in that scene, which then informed what our last scene was going to be. And then uh, Lynn went back and rewrote or adjusted that scene. So it made sense that I was not in that last scene. And, and so that kind of uh, collaboration and, and that kind of uh, conferencing, I think, in, in led to a very, I think, very smart uh, result uh, by the end of it that had to be done there and then shared, shared with us. Lynn is surgical. I've been, and I, I'll say this over and over again, I've worked on a lot of new plays, but Lynn is amazing the way that she um, uh, uh, adjusts, adapts, um, cuts, you know, rewrites in the room. Every single time I, I, she, she would say, I have some cuts, I have some changes, you know, and she says it in this quiet voice, I have some changes. And, you know, it, it, you always knew afterwards, it was always like, yeah, oh yeah, yes, surgical. She knows um, what her characters, what her characters would say, and she knows what her own uh, relationship to language is so well that she can cut tiny words, you know, like, no, it's not a, it's not the, it's not, it's of, uh, close, yes, 
<laughs> yeah, you know, the little those little things make a huge difference. And it was instant. It was instant. You know, she would, you know, we would be reading a script, we're working on a, a piece, and she would say, just, just change that, switch that, switch that around, and it was, it was magic. Mm -hmm. I feel like she was a, um, a really gentle and powerful presence in the room. I think if you want to have a playwright in your room, you want Lynn Nottage in your room. Because she was so supportive and so um, kind and so present. It was beautiful because sometimes I think that you could get interrupted, but she always let the flow go of the scene when we were working on it. And then, you know, then maybe there were changes, but she allowed us to explore first. And she, it was amazing. You, I'd say, I think my character would say this, and she goes, mm, okay, try it. And then um, if she liked it, then, she, then she'd say, please don't expect any payment. <laughs> and I told her, well, the first one's free. <laughs> but it was so lovely to have somebody so cool that you weren't, and she's Lynn Nottage. I mean, somebody said, um, he goes, I'm walking around Ashland and I see Lynn Expletive Nottage walking around. I mean, they couldn't believe that they saw her walking around like a person because she's Lynn Nottage. And it was wonderful. And so many people would say that I saw Lynn Nottage walking around. It's like, it was fantastic. And, and to have somebody so powerful be so kind and thoughtful and present with us was so wonderful. It was a fantastic gift uh, for me. And funny, she has the best theater stories I've ever heard. She would tell me theater stories and I was like, you're making that up. But they were all true. Well, I don't know if she's a writer. Maybe she did make them a lot. <laughs> but they were fantastic. I mean, she was, you know, it was just wonderful. I'm for, for a play about community, we really sort of developed one in the room, which was much in part due to Lynn Nottage and her spirit. Yeah. I think, yeah, no, I'm over here now. Hi. <laughs> um, no, I think what, it's true. I think Lynn has a real, uh, Lynn is a very lovely spirit, and I think she has a, a real kindness and care, and I think which was really necessary with a play like this. And one of the things that impressed me a lot watching all of you work is dealing with such a difficult story, dealing with such difficult relationships between the characters, that everyone really did take a, do a good job taking care of each other, which was really lovely to see. Um, um, I, I ran into a colleague of mine who was telling me that um, she was at a party with Stephen and um, and she she had just seen the show. She had just seen the show, and she she couldn't talk to Stephen because uh, because he he was he was so so darn good that uh, that she really thought he was terrible, um, and and so she couldn't speak to him. And I was just wondering, um, in terms of taking care of yourselves and each other when you are doing such a difficult story, of of how that works for for you all, of how that that magic happens. I think part of the thing about working on a new piece is that, um, different than a classic, is that the changes are incredible. I mean, especially for the people who have the biggest burden of lines or challenge of lines. Um, so I feel like we were there for each other, and I feel the challenges of the run just made us tighter as a group and more supportive of each other as a group. and that was magically perfect in many ways to how we as human beings and friends and cast members bound together. It's something that I'll never forget. It doesn't happen on, on every show. It, I mean, it happens here a lot because we get to know each other, you know, over the course of me being blessed to be here for eight years. You get to know people, but there's certain builds that are so extraordinary, the subject matter of this, and also being a brand new play, and all the information about how it came to be, and people's reaction to it afterwards. Literally, people will stand on the, on the bricks, and they'll wait for people to come out, but they can't talk to them. And that happens a lot here. They're just like, uh, 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 and it's like, yeah, <laughs> you know. So I feel like the challenge of the build. There are a lot of blessings in it, you know, which was, you know, that was a huge gift for me, you know, to be able to, you know, feel like you have we have each other's back and really trust each other. And anything could happen on that stage, and we're like, I got it, you know. That's beautiful, and that's how these people are. They've known each other for. 
30 years, some of them, you know, and since these kids were born, the um, young men who are in it ha know all these people. So it's, there's a lifetime up there, and I feel like we, we, I feel that. I feel like there's a lifetime of connection and knowing each other in this show, which is, you know, the best. And that's the thing about being here, right, as an actor, is because you actually do build up a community with each other. And even the people who I've just met, I have such strong feelings for. And largely it's because of the experience we had building this piece, which is, you know, wonderful. <laughs> I get to do this job, you know, it's so wonderful. I, yeah. I had a, I, what a blessed experience uh, because these guys were new uh, and the three of these guys were new and we already had a relationship to have done shows together. And uh, we have a, a hiking group on, on Mondays. And uh, one of the first persons to come up after finding out that we have this sort of hiking group was Lynn Nottage. And Lynn came up and said, I heard you, I heard you do hikes. I want to do hikes. And she was about on every single hike every Monday. And there were some Mondays when her daughter uh, Ruby was with us. And there was one when her son and daughter were with us. And, it, and the three of us at least went on a couple together. And we've gone on a lot together. And that was every single Monday. And you talk about stories. I mean, because, you know, you're hiking, and you're talking. And, and I had the same reaction. I go, this cannot possibly be true. This, and then I realized that it, it, uh, it almost didn't matter whether or not it was true or not. Uh, what it was is that she told great stories. And I remember about a couple of weeks into these hikes, it was like three or four, it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh. She a great storyteller. <laughs> She's a great, <laughs> you know? And it really, I actually looked at the play with the idea that I was doing a play by someone who was a really good storyteller. And as a character in that story, I had to be a good storyteller also. I think it just shaded the perspective for me of that particular project along with the fact that these relationships were being built uh, outside of the rehearsal hall, which I think uh, just informed us inside the rehearsal hall also. I don't think you can honestly tell this story without a sense of ensemble in the room. Um, the, the theme of community is so strong in this play that if the actors don't come together, um, and if it becomes all about ego, then the story suffers. And I'm grateful to be able to share the stage and share the room for the past nine weeks um, with these talented, giving, loving actors who are willing to honestly tell this story and tell this story from their own heart and from their own perspective and give uh, the story justice. Um, so it's, it's paramount, uh, that community. <laughs> Um, ask for tissue ahead of time. <laughs> I can get some tissue, I'd be so great. Um, Lynn does not write easy stories. She writes plays that at the beginning of the, when they call places, I literally feel like I'm at the bottom of a mountain and I can't see the top. And I know somehow I'll get there. You know, I'm not in the last three, four scenes of the play. And literally, there's a moment where I, I say to him, tag your it," <laughs> you know. But she writes plays where they're so close and they're so um, immediate and they're about the hot stuff. They're about the, you know, the pink, the wet, the, you know, the, vis the visceral stuff that um, you can't stay out of remove. So, you know, Lloyd Richards taught me serve the play. And serving her plays is it's a pound of flesh, man. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's a pound of flesh. <laughs>
Cynthia is so close to me right now as a middle-aged woman in, a, in, in an uncertain industry that it makes me a little crazy. So, uh, but I'm grateful to her because I'm very clear on the fact that nothing happens in a vacuum. You never do a play. I feel like, you know, at curtain call in the dark before the lights comes up, I'm standing next to this man. We always say to each other, best job in the world. <laughs> you know, when there's never a play that you don't do for a reason, there's always some reason in your life that you're tackling whatever it is. I knew exactly why I did Ruined. I knew exactly why I did the last play I did, you know, I had to work out some stuff with my mom, my mom, you know, all this stuff. There are no coincidences. So I'm I'm mega grateful for our Lynn's plays, you know, even though she makes you a mountain climber, she makes you a mountain climber, whether you want to be one or not. But gosh, and she does. I mean, but she writes beautiful mountains. She makes these beautiful, beautiful mountains so that at the end, when you're standing on the side or you're standing on the top watching the people who are standing on the top of the end, you go, oh, yeah, we made it. Again, we made it. We made it. Because every performance is a little, the mountain's a little bit different. It's a different hike <laughs> every every time. So That's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, we, have a, we had a question from the internet, and then I'll open it up to questions from folks here. Sylvia Waterman asks, the play was simply magnific magnificent, interesting, entertaining, well acted and challenging. In my group of 25 people, we are, we're still thinking about the questions it brought up a week later. While working on the play, what did you realize the impact it would have? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, you know? because oof, this is something we haven't talked about in America yet. We haven't really openly talked about, you know, the, the damage done by the D, you know, industrialization of America. We haven't talked about corporate greed. And those words put together are kind of a dirty word in a lot of ways. So we haven't talked about that. We haven't talked about, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we're still trying to parse through the issues of race, of course, you know. We're still parsing through the issues of, you know, generational differences of, you know, we want our children to do better than us, of course, you know, but they want different things than us and they live in a different world than we grew up in, you know. My mother makes my mother crazy that I don't have a job where I get a pension at the end of the day you know what I mean that she you know that she knows that I'm gonna have a pension at a certain time I mean I do but that's a whole that's a conversation for a whole nother day but you know it's 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 not the same thing I'm an independent contractor you know it's it's a different day for you know the generation after me you know for for these guys um, and it, it it's 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 it, it's it's not easy, you know, that going into the room, knowing that we were dealing with these these issues, we knew, I feel like it was obvious we were on new ground. We were new dramatic territory for this country, for America. You know, it's 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 a you know, this is a human situation. It's not like this hasn't happened in other places. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's just an American story. Mm -hmm. It's a human story. So I think it's been one of the things that's been most exciting about working on the American Revolutions plays is that there's a sense of importance that feels built into them. And this one in particular, I remember leaving we did a workshop of the play in New York back in January before we started rehearsals here. And Allison Carey, who's the director of the program the creator of the program, she and I were on the plane on the way back and we we're like, we think we might have the next death of a salesman. It was like this moment of realizing that this story 
is that li it will linger with you in the same way that 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 play did for that generation. It was really very exciting. I mean, for me, I, I'm I'm 26 years old and my career is just beginning, and I knew the significance of this piece when I got this job was the fact that I was coming to this theater, um, which you know, us on the East Coast are highly, you know, most people would agree that this would be our national theater, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, because this is the theater that's doing what is important, the work, and also marrying it with a, a, a great uh, respect for world-class classical work. Um, and and to be here and to be doing a Lynn Nottage world premiere, I mean, that for me was, I, I, knew, I knew the impact it would have on me as an actor and as, as an artist, a young artist, but um, just giving, given the opportunity to do a new Lynn Nottage play at a theater of this caliber was, I, I knew the significance in just that alone. And I had no idea the power of putting together this ensemble and then doing this play was just like icing on the already delicious cake of career -ness. <laughs> I think for me there was there was a couple of steps that all, all worked towards knowing that this was a significant event. I'd come in already doing two Lynn Nottage plays so I already had an expectation that this was going to be significant. I could feel that. Uh, then you know sitting around and you're watching people act with each other and working through the play and you're just listening and you can hear that this is going to be something that's going to be special and then another one was when we had the first in-room run through and this is the invite of certain people from the company uh, coming in like Bill Rausch and people from the artistic office <laughs> I know it's, it's a terrible terrible tie it is it's terrible it's a terrible time but I remember sitting outside uh, after it was run and just watching the people who had seen it come out and they looked like they were in a slight sort of daze and they were like, wow, wow, wow. And just hugging us, just hugging us. And I went, that's, that's significant. <laughs> I've been here enough times to not see that, you know, like, hey, great job. <laughs> You're just where you need to be. And then that and then that audience, the audience that comes in uh, and you find engagement in it. And then that first audience after the lights go out and you feel that moment just before they applaud and when they applaud and that first audience like just about every audience has this response and i'm not putting any pressure on you <laughs> but i mean it's just sort of like oh i've got to applaud this i've got to stand up i am putting pressure on you uh, but, but it's, uh, so to me there was these steps that kept going and kept going kept going and kept saying and kept justifying and kept telling and then you know but it wasn't a surprise at the very and because it was moving towards that. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, this is a really interesting discussion. I'm kind of naive about what it means to be acting in a company like this, and um, I had thought that one, unless it's something like Hamlet, um, that you put on a role for the night or the the afternoon and then when the show's done you take it off and you hang it up with the costume and you do it again in, in a couple of days but it sounds like this is really affecting you is that common or usual that it kind of becomes part of almost your personality or your outlook in a kind of it's grabbing me way like personal is issues thank you uh, if you're if you're playing Hamlet and you do it, you hang that costume up, but you're not you don't hang up Hamlet. Um, and it's I mean it's the same for this piece. I think I, I would argue for any piece. I speak personally. It's been uh, 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 so far for me like a training process and how and how to health help, help, healthfully hang up that costume and that character and be able to step away from it. But I I think I'll say for myself that you you walk away and and you, and you you continue deepening and you continue asking questions and it never really stops. And even once we close the play, it's not, it's it's going to be you know months and months of still shedding pieces of it off. And and because we we do it costs a lot to put on that costume. I mean it seems yes we are we are telling we're doing a play at the end of the day. It's it's a play 
play and we're up there playing. But um, I, I think the reason that we, you know, the reason I'm, I'm still pursuing this is because it, uh, of what it gives to me and what I can give to it. And it does, it's not an easy thing to just shut off, specifically with this play. Yeah. I think that's I think that's one of the I think it goes on a on a play by play basis on a case by case basis you know I think there are there are characters that are easier to just hang up I think everything affects you in some way or another but it, and that that's one of the things about this play that it, it just it hits so close to home um, I think for all of us it, it it feels very much I mean it's about us you know I came from a very very much a working class family and it just it just all of the themes and the, the, the situations that these characters are in and the, and, and the things that they have to go through um, are things that probably each one of us at some point or another has experienced. Um, and, and, you know, I have the great privilege to actually, I feel a lot closer to you guys every night because my character sees everything. You know, I'm a spectator of the events of the play very much. Um, and, uh, and, and 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 so I you know and so I, I I I can see what all of these people are going through um and and it, it, it you can't you can't help but really take it in and it, it affects you it, it affects you um and i agree with steven there is an exercise in in kind of letting that go at the end of the day i sorry i want to add one more thing is one of my i just remember one of my my favorite acting teachers once we were talking about creating role and um he gave this analogy of, of minding the gap and this image of, of there's a there's a role and there's you and there's this gap between and it's about sort of making a bridge that is half that character and half yourself um otherwise it's just you know it's just Hamlet or it's just Jason. But if I meet Jason, then it's Jason and me. And um, uh, I, I, there, there is, there's a, there's a self-preservation that is, for me, it's different for everybody. Some people meditate, some people go to the bar um, and drink IPAs. But uh, uh, but uh, um, but there is, I mean, we, we finished this play and, and it is it is it is very important. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the source of the question. Uh, it is important, I think, to take care of ourselves because it can be, it, people, you hear about Daniel Day-Lewis like losing Daniel Day Lewis while he's working on a play or on a movie and there you know there's there's merit to that sort of style of acting but there's also you know it's a play and we are humans and we have our, our fragile psyches and that we have to take care of ourselves as well so if yeah we're gonna uh, we have a woman in a red shirt I have seen the play and been greatly affect greatly affected by it speaking of bringing your own DNA to the performance do each of you or do any of you have backgrounds that connect to unions or company towns or anything that gave you the ability to present this the way that you did my sister was 17 years old when i was born my brother was 15. my sister because she was bored one day taught me to read when i was four and one of my earliest earliest memories is my dad worked on the railroad and one of my earliest memories is reading the United Transportation Union newsletter that came to the house. Wow. And I very clearly got an, a, a, a sense of the fact that I was part of a larger family, a part of, there, there were brother and sister union members, and that we all had each other's backs. And um, my father was also part of, you know, a huge lawsuit that uh, in order to become a conductor, he was a brakeman and he had to, and he became a conductor. And that was extraordinary uh, impact because once my dad became a conductor, he was able to uh, have a very different you know, uh, we went from being, you know, lower middle class to, you know, upper middle class, which was huge. You know, I was able to um, get the education that my parents couldn't get, you know, to get the education that my, my sister and brother weren't able to get until they were much older. You know, they sent me to uh, graduate school, you know, which was partially a scholarship, but they were able to afford to send me to Yale. And that's huge. So my, and while I was at Yale, <laughs> there was a clerical and technical union strike. And there was a picket line in front of a rehearsal and classroom that I had to go to. And 
that's so much a part of my DNA. You can imagine I ran to the nearest payphone. There were still payphones then. That'll tell you how long ago it was. <laughs> And on the phone crying, mommy, mommy, what do I do? What do I do? So, and she said, you're there to get an education, baby. Nobody's gonna hit you for crossing the line. So she gave, took me off the hook, but the great thing was when it got to, I went to class and when I got to rehearsal, the, <laughs> the director and writer was Wale Shoyanka, who was not having it. And he was like, rehearsal's canceled. <laughs> you know, he was not having it, of course. So, um, but yes, that's the long answer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, growing up, um, I was told by my father um, that you have to be twice as good just to be noticed. Um, and nobody is going to give you a handout. Nobody is going to treat you any differently because of the color of your skin. Um, you have to work hard. Anything that you want in this life, you have to work for it. No one's going to give you nothing, is what he would say to me. Um, and so with that in mind, I was never encouraged to go into the arts. I was told I would never make it. I was told that I was not interesting on stage um, and that nobody would come to see me in a show. And for years, in years, in years, I worked, I studied, I watched people, I watched people on television, I watched people in film, I watched people in theater, and I looked at their art, their craft, what worked for me and what, you know, didn't work, and, and I, I took from that. And what's frightening is that in a drop of a dime, all of that could be taken away from me. Putting on the shoes of Chris has been a nightmare for me because in the drop of a dime, he loses everything. And to hear the wisdom from your mom telling you to go to school, your dad telling you to go to school, and still going after and protecting your community and basically doing what you were told to do, how you were raised, your, your family told you to protect your community and to live in that every single day and to sit in his shoes every single day is heartbreaking. But to hear the responses of the community and listening to people after the show and it's empowering. And I'm grateful to be able to tell a story of a young African-American man that you don't see in the American theater too often. Um, it's rare to see a character like Chris. Um, and a young lady came to me, she's a mother of three, three boys. I think her oldest is 16, 17. And she said, don't ever stop standing in front of people and telling your story because what you don't realize is that you are a voice to my young boys. And so even though it hurts every time and at the at curtain call and I walk back in the curtain and I'm shaking, shaking and I need a hug <laughs> and I'm crying and I wanna get a shot of tequila just to shake it off. Um, I realize it's worth it. Um, it's really worth it and I'm grateful. I, I loved how in the play, chronology is kind of the, the backbone. And my, I have a question for two young men. First of all, Stephen, sorry, um, I, I've never seen makeup or tattoos <laughs> be used the way to kind of describe where are we chronologically. And I'm curious, how was that for you in terms of how quickly oftentimes you have to go in and out of those tattoos and did they help you to 
because the, the two of you have to be in, in kind of two different characters, depending on what chronology you're in, in terms of your personalities and what you've been through. Did the tattoos help you grasp where you are chronologically um absolutely i mean i think the tattoos you know that it's been a it's a it's a it's a it's a great piece of theatricality um uh, uh that we have in the play just there it's just a striking image so yeah it doesn't give anything to me yes and the fact that i uh i have like a physical tangible reminder of where i am in the play um uh, you know, we were we were discussing it in the space we were working. I was convinced it was an impossible feat um, because of just how we were working transitions and how they wanted them all to be, you know, under 15 to 20 seconds. And um, uh, so, in the design of the tattoos, we tried a lot of things, and I, I think what they ended up. I mean, honestly, the, the the application of them is, is nothing to do with me. I stand there and try and breathe and not sweat on the really brilliant, brilliant backstage um, magicians that are doing this. Uh, they're just basically stamps, but they. Have happen very quickly and uh, uh, what the work they do I, I don't I don't envy them it's a lot of pressure um, and it's the other part of the question uh, yeah it does I mean it does it's it's a it's 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 Lynn Lynn has written uh, like Jamel is saying about how, how you know the the the, very, the top of the play is the scene that is extremely extremely difficult for me to even find and the use of those tattoos the image of them helps me get to a place where I, I can't I, I can't look at Tyrone me and Tyrone are good friends and I when I say once I have my tattoos on we we don't communicate half an hour, half an hour we don't talk um, yeah because <laughs> uh, it is it's a very it's a very far stretch from who I am as a person and to have those go test images I think it yeah it's helpful is if that's the right word but um, a reminder I think yeah coming around catch <laughs> in the uh, dealing with the two different parolees uh, one of whom is obviously not doing anything he's supposed to be doing one who's trying very hard <laughs> but you still at least i thought you put a kind of a favoritism to the one of your own race and i'm wondering if that was written in or is that an interpretation you added or how did that come about no it's, it's written in and it's i think it's more uh, it's a little more complex than just about uh race it really is about someone who i think is a, a parole officer i see as at least trying and in in his heart uh, a little bit more not um i used to say in his heart but maybe not having as many real obstacles you talk about the tattoos uh, because uh, uh, Jason's character has to get beyond this thing that he's done to himself before he can really start doing the healthy things for himself and and Chris is at a different place uh, he is at least trying and he's attempting and he is connecting with the right people so I, I yes it's it's part I'm certain that uh, me personally, if I was a parole officer, I'm saying in this world, it's going to be much more difficult for an African-American man to come post prison than it is for a Caucasian man. That's a reality, you know, so I am sensitive to that. So that's certainly part of it. But in addition to that is where they are each and they're in different places. And one of the things uh, it's interesting you bring this up because there were two things that came up in rehearsal that I needed to be clarified about. And one is, okay, I'm being so understanding of Chris, but there's a part of it in which I do lose patience with him and do things to him that is similar to what I do to Jason. And the same way, there are things that I do to Jason 
that are similar to the way that I treat Chris. And they are small and uh, they, they vary throughout the, the scenes that I have with them. But both of the scenes with both of these guys have qualities of both that I have to do. And I, I was unclear about that. And I was discussing it with Lynn and Kate, our director, and she said, you as a probation officer will do anything to get these guys on the straight and narrow. You will be angry at them. You will threaten them. You will uh, uh, try to be sensitive to them. All this is part of the technique that you need to do. And so I thought, oh, he's kind of an actor. You know, because he cannot invest himself entirely in threatening Jason in a real way that he gets so involved in it that he does. Every time I see you, I want to punch you. I want to punch you in the face. I, I cannot actually punch him in the face. That would not be good for a probation officer, but I can't do that even though I want to. But I say that so that he understands how serious this is. And that is another technique to getting him in the place that he needs to go to. So yeah, I think outwardly, and it seems in a, you know, because most of the scene, scenes are about me treating Chris a little more gently than I do. And pushing Jason, but I think within each of those, there's qualities that cross over, and I love those qualities. There's a moment at the end that we have just kind of begun to mine at the end of the Jason scene. Well, all of a sudden, I won't give it away, but there's a turn that happens in that one moment, and I was like, "How?" There are three moments in the play where I go, "How does he make that turn?" I need a moment, <laughs> you know. And 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 Kate and Lynn said, "No, don't take the moment," and that will indicate that it really is a technique, you know. Yeah. So, I have a question. <laughs> I could listen to you guys all day. It's so rich to hear your unpacking of this incredible experience. I have not seen the play. So with that caveat, the question I've really got is a little bit more about theater production process. So it's kind of like I think of the image of cement. When you're pouring cement and you mix it, there comes a point that it sets up. And you just have to kind of go with the mold that, that it's or the are you guys at that point? Is it still malleable? Um, when did the lines start to solidify so you can say, okay, now I know my lines? Uh, how malleable does it remain? Let me just say a quick thing. Um, I, I've been around enough where people go, all right, it's uh, bird's eye time, which means you freeze dry the performance. And I've always resisted the freeze dry. I've always wanted to thaw it and allow it to be malleable. Throughout. Pudding substance, not cement. Pudding. Yes. So that's all I want to say is I understand your, your image of the idea that you kind of solidify and have it. But I think there's a degree of it, which because it's live theater has to remain a long, a long run is more like tending a garden. You know, sometimes, you know, you plant seeds during rehearsal. You know, the seeds are the play itself and things come up during rehearsal and you think you know what you have. And then midway through different things happen and then also the flowers seed and then there's fruit that you didn't know was there you know and then it's fall exactly it, it's 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 really like tending a garden more than anything than building a house you know because there's there's beautiful flowers that you just really didn't anticipate that bloom or you think you know what they're going to look like and they bloom in a very different way or at a different time than you than you thought Constantly weeding. Yeah. Constantly weeding. <laughs> Constantly. That's the stage manager's job. And then you find that really large zucchini that's hidden in the back. You're like, Good God, this thing is huge. Yeah, this has been amazing. We have enjoyed it so much. One of the thoughts that has come to my mind listening to all of you talk about how you put yourself in the role and what you do when the show is over at the end of the day. And I keep looking at you and thinking, a lot of you are in another play too. And how, how do I don't, I can't imagine doing this. <laughs> Not this side of the room. Putting up the street light. Yes. You want to talk about your experience in the, 
in the Thomas Theater. Oh, that madness. Nice. Well, I mean, this year, unfortunately, I'm on a one show contract. You know, I just have to do. And part of me kind of wishes I was doing another show, kind of, uh, <laughs> so that I could have this other thing on my palette, you know, because it really is, you know, doing the two different things. You know, when I was in the Thomas Theater, it did Ruined and American Night. Oh, Lord. And which and every time the show went up, you know, it it was you know, I was working. Every time the, the, the Thomas was up, I was working. And, you know, we had nine show weeks, 10 show weeks. It was madness. But, um, you know, that was, those two shows were so different. You know, really, you know, American Night, I did a zillion characters and, you know, and it was, you know, very, uh, almost a flirty gibbet in a lot of ways because I played Celia Cruz and Benjamin Franklin and, you know, all these different, different characters. Characters. And then, you know, on the other days, doing this long arc as one character in Ruin, Mama Nadi, you know, who's, uh, you know, Lynn wrote this amazingly tragic character and um, Mountain, Big Mountain. Um, but, you know, more so than that, I remember my first season, which I did uh, uh, Our Town and um uh, played Mrs. Webb in our town and played um, Mammy in The Further Adventures of Hedda Gobbler. <laughs> oh. Further Adventures of Hedda Gobbler, if you've never seen it, Jeff Whitty, who wrote who wrote the book for Head Over Heels, is um, the, the, the concept was Hedda Gobbler lives on the cul-de-sac of tragic women with uh, Medea, Tosca, and her housekeeper is Mammy from Gone with the Wind. <laughs> so, you know, crawling into that cave, honey, trust. Uh, you know, but but the, the thing was that I had it was my first season doing two shows at the same time. It was I had to literally like go to sleep. I took a nap after the, the whatever the matinee was, pretend it's a whole new day, take a shower and completely change shift gears. And that's the way that I figured out how to do it. A nap between makes a huge, makes a huge impact. I think that if I was doing another show here, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd take a nap, you know, and take a shower. It's huge. It, it makes a big difference. It's like a whole new day. We we are out of time. No, Carlo, talk, no. talk, talk, talk. Sorry. I mean, yeah, I mean it's it's tough. It's tough, and it keeps you on your toes. But also, uh, I feel like the the plays here are very well curated, um, and there are themes that recur in all of the plays. And I feel like they start to talk to each other. Um, and and I've started to kind of find that in in Sweat and in Much Ado. And I feel like the characters kind of talk to each other, and the places that they end up in at the end um, reverberate in some way. And can I just say one little thing about your question about unions, going back just one second. You know, one of the, as actors, we're all in unions, so there's that. <laughs> but also, you know, one of the things that I do as in this play is I listen a lot. And even when I'm not on stage, when I'm backstage, if I'm not changing, I'm sitting backstage and listening, you know, and being like, okay, what can I learn today? And, the, you know, the word union comes up a lot, a lot in the play. And uh, I, I hit a point where I just, that, that word just started bouncing around in my head. And I was like, oh my God, union, there's union, there's like workers unions, but there's the, there's the union, right? Which is this country. Um, it extends beyond the, the themes in the play and the story of the play. It's not just about these people and this bar and this town. It's about all of us. And often that word comes up, you know, there's several times in the play where somebody says, oh, they're trying to break the union. It can't be done. Um, and the country has fallen apart. You know, we've very much become detached from each other. Um, so I, I, every time that every time that that word comes up, I'm like, there's layers of meaning, you know. So in some sense, we've all had experiences with the union or with unions. It's about this country, you know. It's not just about the people in this factory or people that have worked in unions. Um, it's about all of us. Here, here. Thank you guys so, so much. Thank you, audience, on the webosphere. See you next time.